Good morning. Everyone find a seat, either at a table or out, up in front. Wow, thank you. What, uh, what great cooperation. I want to welcome everyone here at Christ E Free Church uh, this morning. Um, bright, sunny morning, and uh, we thank you for being here. If you have any questions, if you're new for the first time, and uh, please uh, feel free to um, grab myself or some of the other of the uh, leadership team that will be up here um, guiding you through the service, and after service, we can uh, welcome you to the church and answer any questions you might have. Um, but uh, we thank you for visiting, everyone for being here visiting with us. I have just a couple announcements I want to go through just so the people uh, uh, know what's going on this week here at Christ E Free. So um, there is no prayer alive tonight, so take note of that. Um, there are several board meetings uh, this week, Tuesday night. We have deacons and general boards, so please attend if you're a leader. Um, if you're not, please pray for uh, those meetings as they go well. Um, a reminder that Friday and Saturday is a family camp at the Sterling. So if you need, uh, yeah, Art raises his hand. If you have any questions or, or comments, concerns, go see Art after the service. Um, we hope to see uh, most everyone there. Uh, you don't have to stay overnight. Um, show up Friday evening, show up Saturday morning, whatever, um, and, and stay over. We just uh, appreciate uh, trying to get the uh, Art's efforts in getting the church community together on that. Um, Awana, I have a couple announcements for that. And um, Awana has uh, prayer cards available, so see Carol Taylor if you want to be praying for a uh, Awana concern and need. And we do have the Harvest Fair coming up, so she's looking for volunteers and uh, succulent carbohydrate donations. Oh, candy. So uh, see Carol after the service uh, if you can help in, in either, all three of those uh, efforts. And finally, uh, the reason why we're set up this way, uh, just a reminder that we're having our journey wall uh, activity uh, after church. Everyone is welcome to participate in that. Um, there'll be lunch served, and uh, we'll, we'll be participating in the, uh, the journey of our church since 1978 up until the present. So we look forward to that, people attending that as well. So as we go, before we go to worship, um, I want to read to you from a verse from uh, the Word, Joshua chapter 24, verse 15. But if you refuse to serve the Lord, then choose today whom you will serve. Would you prefer the gods your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates, or will it be the gods of the Amorites in whose land you now live? But as for me and my family, we will serve the Lord. Let's bow our heads as we go to God in prayer. Lord Jesus, uh, I believe that everyone here today is because they have chosen to serve you. And Lord, we thank you for that choice. We thank you for calling us to be your children, a family. Um, that you are the Father of all. And Lord, we thank you for that because there is no one else that we can trust more, no one else who's more righteous, no one else who's more worthy of our attention, our service, and our praise. And Lord, that's why we gather here today, to worship you as you called us to do, to give you all the praise and glory and honor. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. Nice crowd. We got a big hole over here, though. Anybody want to sit on a chair? You can always get to the tables later when it's time to eat if you want. Or you can just stay where you are. Glad you're here, though. It's good to be back from Florida. I had a, a trip to, to move Becky and Craig, if you know my oldest daughter, Becky, and her husband, Craig, down to Melbourne, Florida. And so I'd like to say it was a vacation for me, but it was a really a lot of work for all of us. And so we had a good time, good trip, safe trip, and they seemed to be settled in. They found a church that's right on Cocoa Beach. 
And I mean, you, if you, when you walk across the street, which is the main drag of Cocoa Beach, and, in, and down a little path, you're right on the beach. So it's really nice. You can worship and then swim, and, which is good. Actually, they have their baptisms right in the ocean, so that's kind of nice. As long as you don't have really big waves. Why don't you stand and let's worship a little bit together? Then, then you don't. Then, then you don't wait for the pastor to put you under. You just. Get, well, you know how that works. <laughs>
person that just loves the ocean, and when I see it, I, there's a whole lot of things that I see, including God's beauty there. But this isn't about that. This is really about him calling us out to the ocean, to walk with him and to trust in him. And so let's sing this song, Oceans, with that, with that in mind as we sing it.
that you see sometimes on things like Facebook, and one of them is that um, today is Art's birthday, Art Sterling, so um, <laughs> we're just gonna say when you see him, tell him happy birthday. But really, the, the one thing that really hit me was that it's been two years for Amy with her heart. Her husband posted that. Two years. And still smiling. Still happy. And it's good to see Carol. I know what a weekend you've had so far. We, we, we've all been just praying. And we just pray. We, you know, we want you back in so many different ways, but we also want you to feel better. So glad to hear that. Before you sit down, give, give everybody a, give somebody a high five. If you can't do that, just turn and smile to them. <laughs> Turn and smile and have a seat then. going to go to prayer here in a very short time, uh, but I just wanted to mention too, uh, Art was mentioned for his birthday. If you check your, your paperwork, your bulletin, there's a few others that are real close that you can maybe catch them and uh, say happy birthday. All right, one addition here, not an addition, but something I want to mention before we go to prayer. We're going to be doing a uh, missionary of the month. So every month we will uh, introduce a new, a new missionary. Greg and Chris Miller have been up there, so you know who they are. They have a prison ministry. Uh, they have a, a, a little bit of a blurb here. They did mention they have had several people receive Christ, but they also mentioned that COVID in prison is really tough because you are completely isolated if found positive, and that means your menu, all your privileges, everything. And they've been asked to go to New Orleans uh, at the Baptist Relief uh, Chaplain. So uh, we're going to pray that they have good health and be able to do that because they're a little bit older. They've been serving for a long time. Well, just join me in prayer. Yes? What's her name? Jenny. Okay, and that's your cousin. Okay. We're going to include Jenny here in the prayer also. Father, we just are so grateful that we can even do this. Father, I pray that your Holy Spirit never allows us to forget the gift you've given us, the price you paid so that we can have hope, so that we can have a future with you. Lord, help us to never, never let that fade into the point where we don't think about it anymore. As we share with others, Lord, help us to remember that before we had you, we were destined for hell. We had really no hope. And so many people are in that, uh, that state. So as we, as we look at doing your, your will, your job of, of discipling others, of sharing our faith with others, Lord, help us to keep that in mind. And Father, we just are blessed that you call us sons and daughters and you care about us because we are your sons and daughters. Lord, we just, uh, we are people who have bodies that are fearfully and wonderfully made, but there are times when issues take place. Throughout our life, we are going to be dealing with, with health concerns, but we know that you're there to, to hear our prayer and that you, you answer our prayer. Father, I just think of uh, a friend of Gary Myers. Her name is Carol. She's dealing with cancer, bone and liver cancer. Boy, we just lift her up before you and we just pray for an outcome that, that honors you. We pray that uh, chemo, radiation, whatever is decided there, that it, that it will work because we know you use the medical field. But Lord, if that's not the case, we pray that you would just touch her body. Uh, we desire in all these cases that, that we could see a miracle. And yet, Father, we know that your ways are not our ways. You understand the beginning and the end. You understand all things. We only see things from our point of view. So, Lord, we just ask that you would do what is in, what is in your best interest. 
Uh, Lord, we thank you for, for Carol Taylor that she's back with us. We know she has been dealing with some intense pain. No reason for it has been found yet, but we know a lot of people were in prayer, and uh, Carol said the pain, the pain is gone. So we just, we just thank you for that, Father. And I was talking to uh, Pam Gothard. We had been praying for, for Rose, a friend of hers. She informed me that, that Rose did pass away. And we know, Father, that sometimes that is, that is the answer that you give us, as much as we don't want to see that. Father, we continue to pray for, for Mary Zellner, that her health can be made completely, completely well, completely whole. Same with Don Thompson, Lord. We know, pray that there's a good report when he has his, his uh, skin cancer surgery on October 7th. And Lord, we know the, uh, the issue that Gabe Floor is dealing with now, that there are more tumors that have been found. And Lord, we pray that whatever, whatever it's going to take, we just pray that if it's a different type of chemo, if it's uh, whatever it might be, Lord, again, that, that you use, you give those doctors the wisdom that they, they need, uh, Lord, to, to take care of that. Father, we know that the medical field is just such an important part of what you do. So, Lord, we lift Eric's cousin. We pray the same thing there, that she could be completely healed and that she could know that it comes from you. Father, again, we just are thankful for all the healings that, that you give us uh, through whatever means. We thank you for the blessings that you've given each of us, and we just thank you that you love us and call us sons and daughters. And Lord, as we look at how blessed we are materially, we don't talk about it too much, but as we look around the world, our lifestyles, even the poorest among us, is so much better than so many people in the world. We are, we are blessed, uh, and we thank you. And Lord, as we give of that blessing, as we, as we give our tithes and offerings, we just pray that you would take it, and you would guide the... Uh, guide the administration of it, that it will be used widely to spread the gospel uh, here and around the world. And we just ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. today and yes things look a little different around here we don't normally have tables set up nor do we usually decorate the the post of the doorways with tape but that'll be needed in a little bit uh, when we get to the journey wall so uh, anyway you're looking forward to uh, doing that today so people have many different ways of trying to remember what's important to them making a list tying a string around their finger and then wondering what in the world it's there for. They use alliteration, they use mental pictures and other pneumatic devices. When my wife and I, a number of years ago, before we went into district ministry, uh, or actually as we were going into uh, serving uh, our district in New York and New England, uh, we needed a place to live and a church had a home that was given to them by a, a member who had passed away. And as we moved into that house, every cupboard door we opened, there was this list of things, where things were. And, and every drawer, there was notes about where something was, and, and we were laughing. We don't laugh anymore. <laughs> we find that's very important, you know? I, I read a story years ago about a guy who had monogrammed on his socks, TGIF, and someone noticed them and uh, said, uh, "What? you know, that's kind of weird. Thank God it's Friday on your socks. He said, no, that, that's instructions. Toes go in first. I mean, we, we got all kinds of issues that sometimes we need help with trying to remember what's going on. But well, remembering our past is also very important. This is the very first Bible study with Pastor Tom Thompson from Faith Evangelical Free Church in Allentown that was held at Glenn and Helen Miller's home on April 6, 1976, which eventually led to the birth of this church. This is our very first pastor. 
the first service of Christ the Free Church with Pastor Phil Bubar in the Miller's garage because they needed more room and because it was cooler in August <laughs> to meet in the garage. The next pictures are of the new property. A dedication service of the new property was held on May 25th. The building of the, the, the building that we're enjoying now. It's not only fun to review our past, but it's important so that we can remember God's help and faithfulness because that will renew our own faithfulness to God for the days ahead that are yet unknown. On many occasions, Old Testament saints set up a large stone or a heap of stones as a perpetual reminder of the events in their history of how God had been faithful to them and how he had led them. At the very beginning of Joshua's leadership, after they crossed the Jordan River on dry ground, Joshua told each of the leaders of the 12 tribes of Israel to go into the middle of the Jordan River that's dry, pick up a stone and bring it and set up a, a, a memorial to God so that it will serve as a sign among you in the future when your children ask you, what do those stones mean? Tell them that the flow of the Jordan was cut off before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. When across the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off, and these stones are to be a memorial to the people of Israel forever. When the, the, those who were carrying the Ark of the Covenant, when their big toe got wet, stepping into the Jordan, the Jordan River parted and the ground was dry. And those stones were to be a testimony, were to be a memorial of what God has done. This is the first of seven different stone memorials throughout the book of Joshua. For the Israelites, God instated various ways, other ways to aid their, their memory, such as feasts and, fest and festivals. For example, the Passover feast was a reminder of the plagues in Egypt and the provision and protection of God, how God spared the firstborn of each one whose house had blood on the doorpost. Christ himself instituted the Lord's Supper that we'll celebrate next week as a memorial, as a testimony to God's saving power where he, his body was beaten and bruised and his blood was shed for us to pay for our sins. And that's a memorial for us. So today as we construct the journey wall, we too will reflect and retell the stories of God's faithfulness to us as a church. This is an important reminder that as we face new challenges in the days ahead, that God has been ever faithful in the 43 years of ministry to us as a church body. Much has changed over those 43 years of church ministry, but the Lord has not changed and his message of grace and of his love and of forgiveness is still the same. However, just like the children of Israel, life and ministry for us will continue to change. As the Greek philosopher said, change is the only constant in life. Change is the only constant in life. If we look at just one segment, that of transportation, and think about how years and years ago they traveled by, by horse and carriage, and then came along the, the horseless carriage, the, car, the automobile, and then planes, and, and then jetpacks. I remember as a kid watching Jetsons cartoon and thought how ridiculous that someone could strap something on their back and go flying through the air. It's happening. Not to me it won't, but it is happening. 
things aren't quite as far-fetched. You know, I watched Dick Tracy and have a watch that talked to you. Guess what? It talks to me. <laughs> Tells me when to breathe. And oh, never mind. Well, that's a whole other story. So in Joshua chapter 23, we discover that major change was coming to the nation of Israel again. Just like in just a few weeks, the, the, the leaves will all be changing. And they're, they're saying it's going to be a, a fabulous color for, or year for color this year. Uh, just as there are different seasons of life, and just as though our lives are constantly changing, with each new challenge that we face, we can trust that God will still be there for us. In Joshua chapter 23, we discover that a major change was coming to the nation of Israel again. It is now the end of Joshua's leadership, and Israel is facing uh, another new challenge. They were getting settled in the land of promise. They were entering a new era under a new leader as Joshua was about to die. So this is a turning point for Joshua, a defining moment in Israel's life. They had experienced many changes before, and what was going to happen under a new leadership was yet unknown. Joshua feared, feared that they would turn away, that they would lose sight of the mission God had given to them as the people of God, and miss out, and then miss out on the blessings and the many benefits of keeping in step with God. Churches are no different. Over time, we can lose sight of the primary issues the primary mission that God has given to us and allow our lives and our ministries to to be consumed with many other things rather than the main thing that God has for us to do. Like Israel, we too must periodically look back and review of God's faithfulness to the past and then forward to renew our faithfulness to God in the future. That's what Joshua did. He had an urgent message because he knew he was about to die and he needed to prepare God's people for the challenges ahead. So after reflecting on the past and the great things God has done, he challenged them to renew their commitment to the Lord. So this morning, we want to take a look, first of all, at a backward glance to remember, to remember God's faithfulness. In Joshua chapter 23, verse 1, we read, After a long time had passed, And the Lord had given Israel rest from all their enemies around them. Joshua, by then a very old man, summoned all Israel, their elders, leaders, judges, and officials, and said to them, I am very old. They probably knew that. (laughs) But he was 110 years old at this point. And what was the first thing that, that, that Joshua told them to remember as they looked back he wanted, to, he wanted them to remember, first of all, God's provision. God's provision. In verse 3, we continue. For you yourselves have seen everything that the Lord your God has done to all the nations for your sake. It was the Lord your God who fought for you. Remember how I have allotted an inheritance for your tribes, all the land of the nations that remain, the nations I conquered between the Jordan and the great sea in the west. Joshua says, let's remember how God provided. It was God who who did everything for your sake. God provided everything that the Lord has done. An inheritance. God provided an inheritance, the promised land that Joshua helped divide up. They were getting settled into that land, flowing with milk and with honey after wandering around the desert for 40 years. He says the Lord had fought for them, which brings us to the second thing Joshua says. Remember not only God's provision, but also God's power. It was the Lord who fought for you. Remember how I have allotted as an inheritance For your tribes, all the land of the nations that remain, the nations I conquered between the Jordan and the great sea in the west, the Lord your God himself will drive them out of your way. God did it. He will push them out before you, and you will take possession of their land 
as the Lord your God promised you. It was through God's power that the nations were conquered and were driven out so that they could inhabit the land. In verse 10, Joshua talks about how one of you would rout a thousand people because the Lord your God fights for you just as he has promised. And that's the third thing. Not only God's provision, God's power, but God's promise. He is ever faithful. The Lord your God himself will drive them out of your way. He will push them out before you, and you will take possession of their land as the Lord your God promised you. God's promises can be trusted. In verse 14 of chapter 23, Joshua says, not one of all his good promises have failed. Not one of all God's good promises have failed. This promise was first given to Abraham in Genesis chapter 12, when he told Abraham to, to get up and leave his father and go to a land that I will show you. God was working out his promises and purposes for Abraham, and God was faithful to his promise because God was working out his purpose, God's purpose. God's purpose was for them to take possession of the land, that he would bless them. Verse 5 says, the Lord your God himself will drive them out of the way. He will push them out before you, and you will take possession of their land as the Lord your God promised you. God's purpose for the children of Israel was found way back in Genesis chapter 12. God's, God's promise to Abraham. The Lord said to Abram, leave your country, your people, your father's household, and go to the land I will show you. And I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. And I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you I will curse. And all the peoples of the earth will be blessed through you. God's plan of redemption, God's purpose in saving the whole world was announced there in, in Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 to 3 in the Abrahamic covenant that God's purpose for Israel was not only to become a great nation and to inherit the land, but to be a blessing to all families of the earth. Because it was through Israel that our Savior would come. That was God's purpose. God's purpose was to bless the children of Israel and that through them he would bless all the peoples of the earth. Unfortunately, the nation of Israel often lost sight of all that God had done. They, they forgot to look back and remember God's provision, God's power, God's promises, and God's purposes for them. Under Moses' leadership, they wanted to go back to the way things were and return to Egypt. Even though that was slavery, they thought that was better than what God had them in the days ahead. Joshua and Caleb two of the spies that went in to, to spy out the promised land. They gave the minority report. The minority report was says, yes, there are giants of the land, but God is faithful. He, we can take them. But Israel turned their back on the minority report and followed the majority who were afraid of the future and didn't realize that God was doing something new in their day. And as a result, every one of them died wandering in the wilderness except for Joshua and Caleb. They were the only ones. Israel's failure to trust God for the future 
meant wandering in the desert for 40 years until everyone in that generation had passed. Over time, many churches lose sight of their mission and what God has done for them. And they begin to focus on the past and try to perpetuate life as the way things were rather than trusting God for the new work that he wants to do in and through them. And it leads to the same disastrous results. John Madonna said, nothing stops an organization faster than the people who believe that the way you worked yesterday is the best way to work tomorrow. The seven last words of the church is, we've never done it that way before. That is anathema. When we can't trust God for the new work that he wants to do in and through us. Dr. Gary McIntosh says, the past is for remembering, not reliving. Joshua is not just giving a history lesson here. The past provides instruction for the future. The backward glance to remember God's faithfulness provides a foundation for the future. Remembering God's faithfulness in the past will renew our own faithfulness for the future. God told Abraham to get up, leave what you know, and trust me for what I will do in the days ahead. We cannot cling to the past. We have to cling to the God of the future who knows the end from the beginning and trust him. So the backward glance is to remember God's faithfulness. But it leads to a forward gaze, choosing to rededicate ourselves to be faithful to God in the days ahead. Based upon God's faithfulness in the past, Joshua challenges them for the future with four commands. And the first one is to be strong. Be strong. In verse 6, we read, Be very strong. Be careful to obey all that is written in the book of the law of Moses without turning aside to the right or to the left. Be very strong. I'm told by Hebrew scholars that the Hebrew would read, Be strong so that you will be careful to do everything in the law of Moses. That the strength is for obedience. The strength is to obey what God has called you to do. Because of the provision, the power, the promises, and the purposes of God, we can be strong. There is no need to fear. This is what God told Joshua in chapter 1. As as Joshua was beginning to assume the leadership of Israel, He says, no one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and courageous because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their ancestors to give them. They've never been this way before. This is all new territory. But I will never leave you, Jesus said. Be strong and courageous. And he continues, be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, that you may be successful wherever you go. Do not let the book of the law depart from your mouth. Meditate on it day and night so that you, so that you will be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Have I not commanded you? Well, yeah, twice already. (laughs) But God says the third time, be strong and courageous. Do not be terrified. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. God promised Joshua 
and reiterated it three times to be strong and courageous. Joshua had learned that God is true to his word. And so now at the very end of, this, of his life, he issues the same command to the children of Israel. Now, perhaps 25 years after he assumed leadership, he tells the children of Israel as they are faced the unknown of the future, be very strong. Be careful to obey all that is written in the book of the law of Moses without turning to the right or the left. The same God who had enabled them in the past will empower them for the future. The God who, who parted the Red Sea so that Moses and the children of Israel would walk through on dry ground and then who drowned the entire Egyptian army with the waters of the sea. It was the same God who parted the Jordan when it needed to be parted so that Joshua and the children of Israel could pass through. The same God who enabled them in the past will empower them for the future. Though they know not what the future holds, they do know who holds the future, and he can be trusted. So be strong, be very courageous, be careful to obey all the law my Mo the servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from the right or the left. That means to be single-minded. Don't vacillate. Be single-minded, be very strong, be careful to obey, be single-minded in your obedience without turning aside to the right or to the left. This is what God told Joshua in chapter 1. This is what Joshua tells the children of Israel in chapter 23. Be single-minded, don't get off track, be careful to obey all God's word, commit to doing God's work, God's way, and that's according to God's word. Keep the main thing the main thing. And that is doing the mission Christ has given to us, to reach and disciple others for Christ. To reach and disciple others for Christ, that's the main thing. And when we lose sight of that, we become nothing more than a Christian country club and no longer a church. God's mission to his church was to make disciples who make disciples, to show and to share the love of Jesus. So we need to be single-minded. He goes on, he says, we need to be separate from idols. Do not associate with those nations that remain among you. Do not invoke the names of their gods or swear by them. You must not serve them or bow down to them. In verses 12 to 16, Joshua warns them that if they follow after the other gods, the gods of their, of their neighbor nations, that God will quickly punish them. And he tells them to be separate from idols. Israel had a propensity to want to follow after other gods. Just as we have a propensity to allow idols to form in our own lives, things that have an importance in our life that only God deserves. I like this definition of an idol. An idol is anything in your life that takes the place that rightfully belongs to God. An idol is anything in your life that takes the place that rightfully belongs to God. In the church, it could be numbers, it could be programs, it could be traditions, certain ways of doing things. Someone has said, putting it bluntly, tradition is usually the enemy of vision. This was true today as it was in the New Testament times when Christ deliberately condemned the Pharisees and lawyers, the scribes. They had put human traditions in the place of the voice of God. <laughs> the author goes on and says, it is the distinctive responsibility of each believer to live in the present day 
in personal relationship with God and be personally responsive to his voice. Like the Pharisees, we all too often close our minds and hearts to, the, to his voice because what we hear does not fit the patterns with which we have grown up with. Although God does not change, God's message doesn't change, his methods often do. For, far too ma- for all too many, we've never done it that bef- way is a compelling and sufficient reason to g- reject the vision and call of God. You see, the difference between tradition and history, the authors go on to say, is that tradition is history wrapped around the church and set in concrete. Tradition is normally recent history, where tradition is a record of what God has been doing among his people across many generations with all the complexities and adaptability of the spirit displayed. Tradition is normally what God did in the last generation or two, treated as a mold into which his people and spirit must fit today. A commitment to history frees the mind to see many different possibilities, many different ways that God works. Tradition enslaves the mind, chains the mind to see only one valid way in which people must live. That was the problem with the scribes and Pharisees of Jesus' day. Jesus said, or Joshua says, to be strong, to be single-minded, to be separate from idols, and then finally he says, be steadfast in loving God. Be steadfast in loving God. He says, but you are to hold fast to the Lord, your God, as you have until now. The Lord has driven out before you great and powerful nations to do. To this day, no one has been able to withstand you. One of you routes a thousand because the Lord your God fights for you just as he promised. So be very careful to love the Lord your God. We must love God and what he is doing more than we love the way in which we've come to know and to, lo- and to, to serve God. The greatest danger is for us to get caught up in all the traditions where we lose our love for God. To love the Lord, the term is, was used of loyal subjects to their king, and Joshua uses it here to describe being fully devoted to God in every way and to serve him. The greatest challenge, the greatest danger they faced was not a military challenge, but was moral and spiritual decay and collapse to allow other things to replace their love for the Lord. Joshua continued this challenge to rededicate themselves in chapter 24. Verse 14, we read, Now fear the Lord and serve him with all faithfulness. Throw away the gods your forefathers worshipped beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the God your forefathers served beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. And the people responded, answered, far be it from us to forsake the Lord to serve other gods. It is the Lord our God himself who brought us and our parents up out of Egypt from that land of slavery and performed those great things before our eyes. He protects us on our entire journey and among the nations through which we've traveled. And the Lord drove out before us all the nations, including the Amorites who live in the land. We too will serve the Lord because he is our God. Joshua called the people to make a, dif- to make a, a decision, to rededicate themselves to the Lord, to be strong, to be single-minded, to be separate from idols, and to be steadfast in loving God. And after glancing back to God's faithfulness, Remembering his provisions and power and promise and purpose, he calls them to fix their gaze ahead, choosing to rededicate 
themselves to God to be faithful to him. Let me share a couple of life lessons. Number one, we often live in the past because we're afraid to trust God for the future. Like the children of Israel who trusted Christ for each day's manna, so we must lean, learn to walk with God by faith for each new day. The future is unknown, but our God is not. The future is unknown, but we know the faithfulness of our God. Secondly, we are the danger on the highway of life if we keep our eyes fixed on the rearview mirror. Yeah, a rearview mirror is good to glance in occasionally. But you can't drive moving forward with your eyes fixed in the rearview mirror. When we get so preoccupied with the past, we will not be able to understand what God wants to do in and through us in the today and the tomorrow. So we learn from the past what God has done and what we have valued in that process. We live in the present, trusting the Lord and seeking to join him in what he's doing today in the now. And we look to the future determined to pass our faith on to the next generation. That's what God's called us to do. And then the third life lesson is remembering God's faithfulness in the past renews our faithfulness for the future. So as we face new challenges and our lives keep on changing, because change is the only constant, we remember the Lord's faithfulness in the past and resolve to be faithful in the future to all God has called us to do. 34 years ago, Pastor Bubar wrote a letter to the congregation outlining the ministries for the fall, and the letter included these paragraphs. He says, in July 1988, we will be celebrating our 10th anniversary as a church. Looking back over those past 10, these past 10 years, we have seen the Lord Jesus work in many ways through many lives. We have seen our church grow from some 36 people to over 300. We have seen many of you give your lives to Christ being born into his family. We have seen you involved in teaching and serving and helping others. I see in many of you a desire to grow in your relationship with Christ. He continues, he says, our church has a purpose. And it is to give out the gospel of God concerning his son, Jesus Christ, by mass and personal evangelism, by teaching the word of God in its purity and fullness for the salvation of the lost and the building up the saints, the believers. I see our purpose is twofold, to give out the good news of Jesus Christ and to disciple God's people so that they are serving the Lord using their gifts and talents for his sake. We do not know what the future holds for us individually as a church. But God does. It is our responsibility to envision what the Lord would have us to do and then carry it out, allowing the Lord to, re to direct us through his word and through one another. He said it is important for us to plan ahead so we can be more effective as a church. Such planning has already gone on here at Christ Free Church. Lord willing, we will break ground this year on a new addition to our building, adding 8,000 square feet. This will allow us to reach others in a greater way and to better meet the needs of individuals and families. That's a vision. That's our mission, to reach and disciple others for Jesus. And if we don't figure out how to do that, there's little hope for us going forward. But looking back at God's faithfulness and all that he has done, 
is a call for us to renew our faithfulness to that mission and vision, to reach and disciple others for Christ, to make a lasting impact upon this valley. That's what God's called us to do. This past Friday, Brian Ferrone, the, the district superintendent for the North Central District of the Evangelical Free Church, sent an email out. He says, in an, in an ordinary year, September is a time when we reconnect, press on, press ahead on mission and break new kingdom ground and pursue bold gospel-shaped initiatives. But this year feels understandably different. In conversations throughout our district, he said, our team has listened to tired pastors, weary boards, winded church leaders, and hesitant congregations. The uncertainty resonates. We feel the same way as this new season of ministry begins. But he says, in light of this, I want to share a word of encouragement with you. Recently, during a gathering with other EFCA leaders, I heard a prayer that was refreshing, encouraging, and reminded me of the larger truth. The prayer went something like this. God, you don't know what it's like to be confused. God, you don't know what it's like to be confused. He says, this simple prayer echoes what the scriptures cons consistently tell us. Our God never changes. He knows the end from the beginning. He doesn't need us. He owns everything. He is able to do far more than we could possibly imagine. So as you walk with Christ and serve his church during these uncertain days, please remember that our God doesn't know what it's like to be confused. Our God is all wise. He is all knowing. He knows the end from the beginning. As we move forward, no matter how confused we are, we know that He is not confused. Remembering who God is and what He has done, remembering His faithfulness, renews our faith as we step out into the unknown future. You pray with me. Father, thank you that we can rest in the fact that you don't know what it's like to be confused. Father, we, we rejoice, we, we worship you for for your faithfulness, for your power, for your provision, for your protection, for all the things that you have done for us. Lord, we thank you and we worship you for what you have done in the life of this church over these 43 years. Father, help us to not become complacent and, and to renew our mission and vision that, that caused that small group of adults to bind together for a Bible study, even meeting in a garage, and, and then having the, the, the faith to purchase property and build a building so that others in the valley might know you. God, would you do it again? Would you excite us as a body about what you want to do in and through us? Father, you are faithful. We thank you that though we at times stumble and at times we fall, that you can pick us up and set us going straight again. So, Lord, help us today to choose 
whom we will serve, whom we will serve, whether we will serve ourselves and our preferences or serve you. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. When I retired, a lot of people asked me, um, what's it like? And I said, well, you know, pretty much every, every day feels like a Saturday, with the exception of one day, and that's today. And it, because Sunday is a, a special day, a place where, where we, we really need to be together and worship. And uh, a church, another church just closed in Lehigh this past week. Uh, Grace Lutheran on Fourth and Mahoney. You know, it's we need we need to keep going with what's going here. And so better is one day in His courts. Better is one day in His house than every other than thousands elsewhere than every other day. Let's stand and sing this as we close.
Father, how grateful we are that we can have a relationship with you, to walk with you day by day, to know that one day, one day we'll be with you forever. So, Father, we give you thanks for all that you've done and all that you're doing for us. And now, to him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy, to the only God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ, our Lord, before all ages now and forevermore. Amen. Well, I'll ask you to just...